Okay, so we're going to go over the brain and cranial nerves in this chapter, and um, you should have your outlines with you so you can um, follow along as I'm talking, and I'll refer to the outlines as we're going through. So this is the human brain. Um, notice that most of our brain is going to be this large cerebrum, and the cerebrum has these bumps. These are called gyri. Uh, gyrus is singular. Then we have these small grooves, those are called sulci, or sulcus is singular. Um, and so most of our brain is going to be the cerebrum. Then you can see we have the structure inferior, this is the brain stem, the cerebellum is quite a large piece of the brain stem. So um, the direction of our brain uh, rostral is towards, this really means towards the snout or towards the nose, and then caudal means towards the tail. So these terms are sort of for animals, but we use them for the human brain. So anything that's more forward towards the what we call the anterior, that's also known as rostral. Inferior is also known as caudal. Here's an inferior look of the brain. So when you guys are looking uh, and studying the brain diagrams and images, you should know the brain from all um, views, just like you learn the skull in all views. So this is the inferior view of the brain. We'll reference that. <clears throat> And this is the mid-sagittal section of the brain. All right, so letter A is the embryology of the central nervous system. So about two weeks into development, the um, mass of cells that we can kind of see here in this diagram start to change and develop into three um, major tissue types that will later on become, of course, everything in the body. The three tissue types are listed for you here. There is the endoderm. These are known as germ layers. So the endoderm, which is fated to become the internal organs, the mesoderm is fated to become a lot of the muscles, some organs, and then the ectoderm, this is what's going to become skin and our nervous system. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the ectoderm. And the ectoderm is going to fold, um, it's there, it starts off as a sheet, which is called the neural plate. The neural plate will start to fold and when it starts to fold, the groove is called a neural groove. And then the uh, finished product is a tube called the neural tube. And I'm going to see if this works. I'm going to bring up this um, YouTube video here. So what you're seeing is a frog egg that's undergoing this massive movement of cells in development. But what you're going to start seeing is the neural plate here and you'll start to see a fold right it's forming a neural groove we have the folds coming together there and now we have a complete neural tube and then we can start to see the upper right hand side develop into the brain the head of the, the frog and then the other end is going to develop into the um now let's talk about the neural tube defect so the reason why you want to know about the um, development of the nervous system is because there's a defect known as neural tube defects so when those two edges of the neural folds meet, they seal, and there is the um, sort of normal development of the brain and spinal cord from that tube. However, if the tube fails to close um, in the area where the brain develops, then you can have a condition called anencephaly. And then uh, if the more common condition is where the tube um, doesn't completely seal for the spinal cord develops and that's called spina bifida okay so spina bifida can occur with or without herniation the meninges which we'll talk about in a second can <clears throat> herniate through the skin in one kind <clears throat> and I'll show you this is spina bifida cystica where the meninges around the spinal cord are expanded into a bag like cyst and the danger here is that this wall is very permeable and when the baby is inside the womb the baby does urinate inside of the womb and in that urine can contain irritating substances that can cross through the cyst and um, irritate and harm the developing spinal cord so um, that is a dangerous condition it can cause paralysis it can it can cause lots of problems um, the thing I want you to know here is that 70% of spina bifida is caused by not getting enough or adequate folic acid in the first month of development. 
Folic acid is something we talked about before in the skin chapter, where it's a vitamin that can be broken down by excessive UV radiation exposure. So for women, it's very important that they are getting enough folic acid in the diet in those very early weeks of pregnancy, because folic acid is responsible for um, sealing that neural tube. All right, so let's take a look at, um, we talked about the neural tube defects, and then let's talk about um, the regions of the neural tube. So here's a concept check for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have several concept checks in this um, PowerPoint, and I'll put the answers for you in the very last um, portion of this PowerPoint lecture. All right, so let's talk about the meninges. So I'm going to skip letter B for now. Um, we'll talk about that um, in pieces as they come up. <clears throat> but let's talk about the meninges. So your brain and spinal cord are covered by a protective um, actually three layers of tissue called collectively the meninges and let's take a look at all the steps down from the, the skin to the brain so we can see our scalp the next layer down we have an epicranial aponeurosis so this should be familiar to you this of course is that aponeurosis the sheet like tendon that is going to help bind the frontalis to the occipitalis muscle now we have some periosteum, right? So we know that our bones have a, a membrane covering them called periosteum. Then we have the bone itself. Now underneath the bone, we're gonna have the meninges. So the very first most superficial is called the dura mater. The second one down is called the arachnoid mater. And the third one that's very delicate and almost invisible in this image, and it is invisible, is actually called the pia mater and you can't see it because it's so thin and delicate. So let's take a look at our first <clears throat> um, of the meninges, which is the dura mater. Dura mater is uh, technically translates to tough mother uh, in German. So dura mater, and it's a double layered membrane. So you can see there's one layer here and there's a second layer. Um, they come together, of course, but in areas they do come apart. The two layers come apart. So um, when they do come apart, it is known as a sinus, um, and the sinuses are gonna act like blood vessels. So they're gonna act like veins that are gonna drain the blood from the brain back down to the heart. Um, so in your notes, you have sinuses, um, they're gonna act like large veins. So they're not technically veins, they're, they're sinuses, okay? So the, the actual sinuses, like labeling superior sagittal sinus, that will come in the vasculature lecture. So let's look at um, the other bolded words in this area. We have a subdural space or potential space between the dura and arachnoid, and then we have a false cerebri. So let's take a look at that potential space, the subdural space, which is here. So underneath the dura, which is a subdura, there's not actually a physical opening. However, um, it can become one uh, if it starts to fill with blood. So let me show you that there's blood vessels here, right? There's a network of blood that's trapped underneath the arachnoid mater. So let's fast forward a little bit and just talk about the arachnoid mater is our next level down, the next layer down. It, there is a physical space called the subarachnoid space. And within the subarachnoid space, you're gonna have a couple things. You're gonna have some cerebrospinal fluid and you're also gonna have your um, blood vessels. So this potential space, this subdural space can become expanded. So this is another look at it. Here's our subdural space, not much of a space. But what I'm getting to is <clears throat> this image here. So in a brain injury, so if you have a very hard hit to the head, <clears throat> bleeding can occur in these blood vessels um, that are trapped sort of between the dura and the brain. And there's no natural way out for that blood to drain. So what could happen is called a subdural hematoma or subdural hemorrhage. So the, the blood vessels in that region break open the blood starts to pool. And since there's no natural way out underneath the dura, it gets trapped. And that little bit of a space becomes a larger and larger space as it fills with blood. A hematoma is basically a bruise where you can call any bruise on your body a hematoma because it's a broken blood vessel, the blood gets trapped in certain areas. And under the skin, you can see the blood. You can see the purplish reddish color. Um, <clears throat> obviously you can't see it through the skull. But what's dangerous about this is that the blood can 
um, fill this space and then it can compress the brain so the brain is soft um, think about a firm tofu uh, that you might have in the refrigerator that's the consistency of your brain your brain is very soft maybe not even firm tofu maybe just regular tofu um, but if you put any pressure on it you can deform and compress the brain which is a very dangerous um, obviously very dangerous um, thing to happen okay so that's a subdural hematoma which is associated with our subdural space and then let's talk about the false cerebri so the false cerebri is this structure here it's this sheet made of dura mater and it comes in between the hemispheres of our brain so many of you know already that we have two halves to the brain the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere those halves are actually connected in the center so there is some connection between the two halves of our brain but in the more superficial parts where you have this this is the, the two halves are separate but there's a sheet of dura mater between them called the false cerebri it is attached in the anterior portion to the um, crystagalli. It is also attached in the back to the internal occipital crest. So why do we have a sheet running between the hemispheres of our brain? And this is to sort of fasten our brain so that it doesn't um, have too much wiggling capacity inside of our skull. So think about having a three pound um, tofu organ uh, in our skull which is a hard organ and every time you sort of jostle your head or shake your head or bump your head your brain literally can ripple inside the skull so there's mech this the false cerebri is one structure that helps to stabilize the brain so that if you do get hit or if you are sort of you know your head is being moved around uh violently that uh, it helps to stabilize the shaking within the brain so that's the false cerebri. All right, let's talk about the second one. <laughs> there's other um, structures that help stabilize as well. You can see there's something called the tentorium cere cerebelli, but we don't cover that. I'm just gonna cover the false cerebri. Okay, so the uh, arachnoid mater is our second layer down. Let's look at this picture for that. So this layer here is the arachnoid mater. There are these downward, you know, spider-like um, granulations. Actually, they're called uh, trabecula that come down into that subarachnoid space. Um, but what you really want to know about this space is that it's filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So there's going to be one to two millimeters of cerebrospinal fluid in this space. And that is going to um, be a source that you can extract cerebrospinal fluid within the, the spinal cord. So arachnoid mater, the subarachnoid space. And um, let's go to this picture to talk about the arachnoid granulations. So you'll find a bolded word called arachnoid granulations and the cerebrospinal fluid I mentioned has to circulate. So you're making cerebrospinal fluid as well as um, uh, letting it escape back into the bloodstream. So that escape hatch uh, for cerebrospinal fluid is going to be this structure right here. So this is called an arachnoid granulation. So the cerebrospinal fluid is that's circulating here can come through these arachnoid granulations and then permeate back into the bloodstream so that you always have a certain specific level of cerebrospinal fluid in our subarachnoid space not too much not too little you're making it every day so you also need to drain the same amount every day back into the bloodstream so that's really important for you to know these arachnoid granulations i'm going to go ahead and skip spinal tap uh, for this lecture i'll go to it when we talk about the spinal cord so let's look at the pia mater number three so the pia mater is going to be that invisible layer. Uh, pia mater means soft mother. Here's what we're looking at. So it's this sort of beige line that you see. It hugs the brain itself. It hugs the, the short, or sorry, the shallow sulci of the brain. And it dips down into all the grooves. And even that, the major groove down the middle of the brain is called the longitudinal fissure. It goes down there too. Um, so here's another look at this pia mater, right? So the pia mater is just directly on the brain, it's attached to the brain. Very thin, very delicate, invisible to the eye, but it's uh, also, it is a source of sort of binding those smaller blood vessels to the brain's surface. All right, so there's our nice picture of an actual 
um, our meninges here. So you can see the dura mater, how tough it really looks. You can see that the blue structures here, those are where those double layers of the dura mater has opened up to allow that um, deoxygenized or the oxygen poor blood that looks blue here to drain from our brain. Um, you can see the cerebrum, you can see the cerebellum, and I think that's it for this picture. All right, so this is our second question. All right, so we'll do this in the next 